yesterday, um, I was talking most of the time, about 95% of the time. I want to change that, and uh, I will still be talking. But um, I want to start with uh, questions and answers, because we ran out of time, because I w really wanted to cover a lot of the stuff yesterday to, to give you sort of a holistic view of the issue of oil economics, from prices to management. Um, I know that some of you had questions, and you came to me and asked questions, which you, by the way, welcome, more than welcome to do afterwards as well. But um, I want to give you now an opportunity to ask some questions from yesterday, and then I will talk again about more practical aspects of uh, oil um, wealth management, especially with uh, references to Israel's case. Uh, and I will try to answer some of the questions uh, or, or concerns that exist, as I understand them, from what I read, what I heard from Monday's uh, presentation from Noble Energy, uh, the concerns that exist in, Isra in the Israeli society. And then we will go into questions and answers again. So let's do it this way. Uh, I'll put the, here are the uh, main topics from yesterday. Uh, I was talking about uh, the fall in oil prices, thank you, and what it meant for the uh, oil industry and what features of the oil industry and global energy market it reveals, that drop in oil prices. Uh, the role of the shale revolution and how the shale industry in the U.S. is organized and run by private companies. Remember the 13,000 uh, that I mentioned? Um, how that affects uh, the ability of the U.S. to ra raise production. Uh, then the second one was the role of the state and how institutions determine whether resources are a curse or a blessing. Uh, and I gave some examples, some failures, but also I mentioned some success stories, which I will talk more about today. And finally, I raised a question about the future of the petrostate, as it's called, the oil economy uh, in general. What will happen to it? Uh, why people are getting unhappy about corruption, about the deterioration of institutions? Um, so, uh, and I mentioned Russia, of course. Um, so, uh, please, uh, questions. You were first. Uh, a bit uh, unrelated one, Okay. Uh, Not uh, too unrelated, though. Just one, yeah. Uh, about the drilling in the North Pole. Okay. It's a big political or environmental issue. Mm. Like, uh, if you yeah. have also Russia and the United States, mm. um, if you can elaborate. Uh, okay. Um, drilling, you mean the beyond the Arctic Circle? Arctic, it's called, yeah, Arctic oil and gas exploration. I'll actually talk about it uh, with some examples, but um, the, uh, there are two things. First of all, uh, about a third of all gas reserves worldwide are there. So big competition for Israel, potentially. I'm not joking. Um, oil less so, it's primarily gas. Um, it is uh, problematic now. The second thing is that is a lot of it, but it's a problem because it's very expensive to develop. So when prices fall, like now, the, there are there's sort of a scale of projects. The cheapest sustain low prices for longest. The cheapest to develop, the 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 least costly. The most costly ones. Uh, are the first to go. So the Arctic projects are the first to go from an economic point of view. So for instance, in Russia right now, uh, most all actually, apart from one project, are put on hold. Norway is different because they started earlier. And this is an important, I think, lesson for Israel. Start early. While prices are high enough, I mean, high or low is everything is relative, right? Well, they're high enough to explore, invest in development, and produce. Because once that's done, 
Those are sunk costs you can carry on producing. It's the first stages that which are the most imp uh, expensive ones. So Norway has gone through these stages in its Arctic projects. And now it's producing oil and gas in the Arctic. Same for the United States uh, in Alaska. So um, Alaska is producing. Uh, there are lessons to be learned from that. Uh, and it's also interesting that what lessons can be learned from, especially from Norway and Alaska, by Israel because uh, Israel has also offshore gas and deep water. It's not Arctic, luckily, uh, which makes it more expensive, both to develop, produce, and transport through the permafrost of the Arctic. But uh, the technological, in a technological sense, it's closer to that. So I think Israel, paradoxically, should study the development of Arctic projects. On the environmental side, uh, it's a problem to some degree. Uh, for wildlife, uh, um, it needs to be care taken care of. There's no question about it. Uh, it's, on the other hand, I'll tell you, there are different attitudes to that because uh, uh, is there a link to global warming? Well, not a direct one. Okay, from, from a particular project in the Arctic, the, the planet is not going to be warmer. But there is a reverse uh, connection, because if, the, if it's true that the, pro, the planet is getting warmer, if, then of course developing the Arctic is, is going to become cheaper, because the ice will melt. Maybe not everywhere, but in many areas, it will make it cheaper to develop through the permafrost. So um, some of the oil companies which operate there are probably secretly you know, waiting for the global warming to kick in. Uh, whether it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing for the rest, again, it depends. For Israel, probably not so much. But for Russia, it could be a good thing. OK. Um, I'd like to ask uh, regarding the future of the petrol state model and in general the future of the oil industry. It seems like the the industry is going to face a major disruption because of technological innovations in uh, energy production. I'd like to hear how you think it might uh, affect the future. Are you referring to technological innovation as in renewable energy? Yeah. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Well, you know, um, I mentioned yesterday that still oil is the largest fuel and uh, the uh, 80 or so percent of the entire energy mix is fossil fuels. Um, well, nuclear, whether well, nuclear is, well, yeah, nuclear as well, but uh, it's, you know, it's hydrocarbons plus coal. Uh, it is at the moment. Uh, renewables, uh, or I, as I prefer to call them, alternative energy, uh, alternative energy is growing, but slowly. Um, but one thing to, I think, conceptually uh, understand is that the world was, will not be running on oil or gas. Uh, unfortunately for Israel, perhaps, uh, with its big uh, gas reserves. Um, mm, but something will replace it. We don't know two things, what will replace it and when. And as experience has shown, uh, history has shown, uh, usually the attempts to guess what and when are wrong, uh, including attempts to guess that by the government, which is, as the expression goes, is picking winners. OK, oh, solar, wind, uh, you know, biomass. We'll put our money there, or subsidies, or tax breaks. Uh, that's not how innovation works. And the example of the shale revolution is, I'm going back and back to that example, because it's um, very important. It shows that an industry which wasn't getting any subsidies, zero, the shale industry wasn't getting subsidies. Some tax breaks, well, not even breaks, rather special, spe specially adjusted tax rates. But that's common practice in the oil industry. 
you need that. If it's a difficult to develop uh, deposit, you need that. So there's nothing new about this. But they weren't getting subsidies. Um, and they were working, you know, they were competing against, I mean, they, the small and medium companies developing shale oil and gas, uh, with the majors. Uh, and they sustained that competition. Um, that's an example of energy innovation. A lot of the environmentalist organizations, they don't like that. They don't like to talk about it because it's hydrocarbons, bad, right? But the reality is two things. Uh, first of all, it is innovation and it's in energy. Uh, and it's top class innovation. It really changed the whole perception of the hydrocarbon industry as big, heavy, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, with, uh, with their, uh, where the production hasn't, ch uh, where methods haven't changed for a long time. Uh, all these oil men are sort of seen as conservative uh, uh, and rigid. But uh, the shale industry turned that around. And secondly, the, the most interesting thing is that the shale industry showed that from an environmental point of view, uh, it's also working because in America today, and that's, again, you won't hear it from the environmentalist lobby, but it is a fact that, think of it for a minute, uh, America didn't sign the Kyoto Protocol. Europe the European Union was the biggest proponent of the Kyoto Protocol the biggest motor behind the ratification. And I was involved uh, in, in the process of negotiations uh, back in the mid-2000s, so I, I, I know how it was going uh, on. And uh, the interesting thing is that Europe hasn't fulfilled its obligations. The US has, exceed, has actually reduced, it didn't have any obligations, but it reduced in the same period of time t since Kyoto's ratification, it has reduced greenhouse emissions. Isn't it a paradox? Some people don't even think it's possible, but it is because it has nothing to do with regulation. It has to do with the fact that as a result of the shale revolution, shale gas revolution in particular, America is now uh, producing more gas and the share of gas in the energy mix has increased, replacing coal. And coal emits, uh, to, uh, emits about 70% more greenhouse gases than gas. So as a result of this, the actual emission amount has decreased in the United States. Um, and I think this is an important example. To, uh, to go back to, you, to your question about um, technological innovation and uh, its effect on the petrostate. Well, uh, like o lower prices, it will have an effect. I mean, uh, when alternative energy replaces fossil fuels, uh, that will be, as I would say, the last nail in the coffin, maybe, of the petrostate. Because uh, the uh, the essential uh, source of revenue for a petrol state is what is in the ground. Um, when this will happen, we don't know. If someone is hoping for a quick end of the petrol state because of that, um, I think we would have to wait for a while. I think it's important to reform the system of the petrol state before the, the next energy revolution of alternative energy. Because the uh, negative consequences of a petrol state uh, are, can be too great, as we've seen yesterday, as the examples of Venezuela, Iran, and so on, show uh, too, too negative. Um, and deteriora the deterioration can be too quick to wait until the alternative energy revolution. Okay. Um, we were talking yesterday about how the institution is important for economic growth when it comes to oil and gas companies, mm -hmm. and that it's important not to nationalize um, the, the companies. 
However, I think also Lini Zomer uh, talked a lot about it. After you decide this decision, there's still like there's still a taxation uh, decision. Yes. Which I think like in Israel is the most relevant decision as people talk about the the, the gas market. Yes. So my question is, what do you think should be the discussion, or how should the government decide what is the right taxation? For those companies, in order also to make sure that entrepreneurship continues and people <coughs> would like to continue and search for oil and gas, and also that everybody can enjoy the natural resources that are found. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Great question. Where's the balance? And I'm going to talk about it, uh, but um, let let me start talking about this, both in the Israeli context and in general. Um, that it's important to understand that oil and gas are not treated like uh, any other business. There's a reason for that, and there is a underlying um, discussion about this: who owns natural resources? Uh, remember, I mentioned yesterday the example of the United States, where you own everything that is underneath the ground of the land that you own. That's not the case in any other country. Actually, in Canada, it's partially the case, but in a sort of very funny way, because they only recognize it on land which was purchased before uh, the end of the 19th century. So everything that was then r sold to someone, doesn't, that doesn't apply. So effectively, it's only the United States, really, um, which has that system. And um, m in most other countries, uh, people and governments don't even understand that. How is it possible? So you bought a house, you bought the land under the house, and like everything which goes all the way to the core of the earth is yours? I, hold on a second, but that belongs to the people. But here's the question. I mean, okay, perhaps, uh, perhaps you could say it belongs to the people, but then the question is who is the people? Because usually, let's say in practical terms, it's the government. And it's the government taxes on behalf of the people, supposedly for their benefit. Whether that's the case or not is a big, big, big question, right? So um, nobody asked people how they want to manage, for instance, running an oil business. And let's say that the way it's taxed today is not the most efficient one then perhaps the people would be more happy with a different system of taxation. But anyway, the, the current system in Israel and in most other countries is based on the premise that until the gas or oil is sold by the developer, by the company, the, the oil and gas company, it belongs to the government. So you need to pay the government what is called a royalty to be in the possession of this mineral, for instance, gas. Um, and then, once you sell the gas, then you, like any other normal business, you pay a tax on your profit. In some countries, luckily not in Israel, because I think that the Israeli system is better in that respect. In some countries, the system can be even worse, for instance, in Russia because you don't pay a profit tax. The government doesn't care whether you make a profit or not. You pay a, a tax on the volume, which is not good for companies because they can make a loss and still owe the government a huge amount of money. That's not the case in Israel, but the, uh, I would say that, okay, royalties are a common practice. So, uh, you know, it's an interesting philosophical discussion who owns natural resources. Um, but in practical terms, Israel is not going to switch to the American system. So royalties are here to stay. Um, as to taxes, I prefer, and not just me, uh, it's most uh, economy, petroleum economists prefer a profit tax, the way that Israel has it set it up. Um, the uh, a system based on the volume 
of sold and market. The market value of the sold uh, gas or oil by volume is worse. It's, it creates less incentives for, for companies to operate efficiently. Um, it, when it comes to the, to the tax rate, that's another question because Israel, and I've seen it in other countries uh, because I worked with various governments, I've seen it. Uh, it's a typical situation of a, you know how they say, a new kid on the block. Israel is a new kid on the block of the gas market. So it's exciting. And uh, a lot of companies are talking about it. When I go to conferences, especially Mediterranean conferences like uh, uh, held in Greece or Cyprus, Israel is a big topic of discussion because it's a new hydrocarbon province and because it's so important geopolitically. And there's a lot of excitement. And with excitement comes um, come hyped up expectations. Oh, we now have a trillion cubic meter of gas. Gosh, you know, just 10 years ago, it was something like um, 50 billion. And now it's 1,000 billion. Wow, a lot. And now other companies are drilling, and it's, they're saying, it's not confirmed yet, there could be up to another 2 trillion. So altogether, it would be 3 trillion, you know from 50 billion to 3 trillion. And people get this excitement. And of course, with excitement comes what? Political populism. OK, let's tax them. They, they got a massive price out of nowhere. That's the perception. It, it's interesting. So before there was no gas, or almost no gas, very little of it, OK, Israel lived without it. Now it turns out Israel has a lot of gas out of nowhere, but it's not out of nowhere. The only reason why Israel has discovered this gas is because certain exploration companies have invested in exploration and were successful. So in a sense, you're punishing them, kind of, for being successful by increasing the tax rate. Um, there are two issues. One is legal, and the other is commercial political as well. That's the third angle. But uh, I'm not going to talk about Israeli politics. Uh, so from a legal point of view, that's what is uh, called a uh, retroactive policy, retroactive tax. And um, um, Noble Energy, um, trying to look, what's the other company's name? Um, the Israeli one. Yeah, Delek. Delek. Um, they were unhappy about the uh, retroactive tax. Well, I would be unhappy as well. You know, if you agreed on something, uh, you agreed the terms. It's written in the law in the 1952 uh, uh, petroleum law. That's that's how you go to the bank and borrow money based on profits, which will be taxed with this rate, which was 12.5% on profits, I think, and something else added to that. Low, true low, by modern standards, but that's how it was. Uh, but nobody expected that they would find it. So it was only reasonable to have a low tax rate to, to uh, uh, attract all these companies, like Noble and Delic. Uh, Noble as an American company and Dalek as a Israeli local company. Um, and they uh, invested, they risked their money, they went to the bank, they borrowed based on this tax rate and the certain return that they would get. And then when they uh, announced a discovery, you, you turned everything upside down. You, you, uh, you know, you uh, lift the table and you throw everything in the air. Now everything's different. Well, from a legal point of view, strictly speaking, not good. There was a, um, an, uh, a discussion about, OK, well, they applied this tax rate written in the law to what they already produced before, but they're only changing it for future production. OK, maybe. That is a bit different, yes. 
But then there is, this is the legal side. Um, some questions, it's, it's not black and white. But then there is the, um, uh, the, the commercial side. And I would say the commercial side which ties into uh, the image of the country. And this is the biggest problem because when a country discovers a lot of gas or oil, uh, there's, as I said, this excitement. Uh, it's very political. Uh, everyone thinks that uh, the, um, the, the oil companies are already sitting on uh, sacks of gold, you know, uh, drinking oil, uh, eating gold, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that they're mega rich and they're s somehow taking it from the people. Um, there's that. But then, and they tax them to the maximum. There's a big bargain uh, and a big negotiations. They try to squeeze as much as possible. Uh, the companies, uh, you know, Noble sp has spent already a billion dollars in exploration, a billion in development. Uh, and they're planning to spend another 3.5 billion. Uh, so they have, and they approved it in February, you know, uh, they approved the, the investment of 3.5 billion. So now they're uh, basically stuck, as um, Beanie said. They're, they're stuck. And he was honest. He said, now when I think back, after everything happened, would we do that? Probably not, or not at that scale. Because so many things have happened. So you, in effect, you're kind of punishing them for success. Because you know what? If they owned a factory for the production of, my, uh, you know, uh, of, um, I don't know, cell phones, well, they c in a couple of years they could relocate it to China. Can they relocate uh, Leviathan? Can they re relocate Tamar, which is already producing? No, they can't. So that's part of their portfolio now. They're stuck with it. And the government will go back to them and say, no, 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 actually, this is unfair. Um, so they're, uh, they're kind of stuck with it, and it's cre it creates the following problem. The politicians think they're st strong, tough. They squeezed uh, the last penny out of an oil company. Maybe not the last, but you know, they're taxing them to the, to the max. It's, f it's only fair for the people. Well, here's the question. You know, it's possible that Israel has another two trillion, uh, two trillion cubic meters of gas. Um, have you heard about many comp new companies coming to Israel, bidding for licenses or negotiating with the government since Delek and Noble? I haven't. I know there are a few opera uh, small exploration companies, but I mean major companies. Is there a lot of, there's a lot of hype about Noble energy. There's a lot of hype about the current project. Is there a lot of hype about future? The other two possible trillion cubic meters, which could make Israel richer? No. And you know why? Because investors are worried now after what happened with the negotiations. They're worried that uh, they will be hit with extra tax once they reach an agreement. They know that the Knesset approves these things. There was the Shashinsky Commission and the other, forgot its name, Commission on Security. So um, they know that once they reach an agreement with Netanyahu, possibly personally, because he likes to you know, decide these things, nothing is guaranteed. And I mean, yes, you could say it's democracy, but then there's, there's a concept of a contract. And this is political risk. With a lot, which a lot of them will not want to carry. So um, I think um, the whole kefuffle, as they like to say in Britain, around uh, uh, the whole um, conflict with, with the environmentalists, the populists, the, who else was there? Uh, political parties, the, the activists, uh, the uh, anti-monopoly guy, 
um, the regulator, and so on and so on. It didn't do much good for Israel in terms of its future uh, attractiveness. Mm -hmm. Just say one thing to add to that. It's interesting that it really just boils down to a different thing. So the core thing that a company decides when they're going to make an investment is, is, is the rate of return. They, yeah. need meet, they need to meet a minimal rate of return to justify the project. But the rate of return, so the question is what rate of return is going to justify the project. The more risk that's, that, that's perceived uh, raises the minimal rate of return that they need to do the project. It was just simply a risk. So the dimensions of, of what you said, just said, Peter, that you know, once you, for, for a natural resource company, once they make the investment, they can't move. And all sorts of scenarios in which the government's going to change the rules and make it more unattractive, it just simply kicks up the rate of return. Yeah. So, so they, they made the initial investment based on, on probably a lower rate of return assumption than they would have used. But new companies that, that are now looking at the situation adjust the rate of return. And, and they have a higher rate of return that's necessary to justify the project. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right, Bob. Uh, that's exactly how it is happening. Okay, have I answered your question? Yes. Um, more questions? More questions, please. Um, maybe you've talked about it, but it's somehow related. But um, what is the main difference or, or the main reason that, uh, as I understand it, in Norway, the national uh, energy resources are uh, the energy resources are mm. national and seems to be <coughs> successful? Uh, so, what is the main difference between Norway and the uh, and Iran, right. There are many, but uh, you're right. Um, I, you're almost reading my mind. I was about to mention Norway as an example, and you just asked the right question. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Norway is an interesting case. Um, why? Because it is, by different accounts, number three or number five or number six, depending on which... Uh, which calculation you trust, IMF or World Bank and so on, but it's in the top 10 for sure in terms of GDP per capita. And we saw that in uh, Robert Barrow's uh, presentation as well. So it is very, very rich. Norway is very, very rich. Well, not surprisingly be also because it has a small population, but that's not a guarantee of being rich. Um, Norway and I think that Israel has a lot to learn from Norway um, for the following reasons. Uh, Norway is relatively new as a hydrocarbon province. The main discoveries were made in the 70s and 80s, and the bulk of the production started uh, in the 80s and then grew in the 90s. So it's, by historical standards, it's quite new. Secondly, a lot of it is offshore. And those are big, uh, expensive projects. It's not like uh, small wells in, in, in America's onshore, for instance, and shale. It's big, expensive projects. Um, thirdly, they also, you see, went through a phase of populism. Uh, they had a very populist government of the Labour Party up until the 80s. And then uh, the Labour Party lost, and it's, it's a common case. It happened also with Australia. Uh, it happened with some other countries. Norway was doing very badly economically. Not just because it, didn't discover, it had not yet discovered oil and gas, but in general, it was mismanaged. It was run by a populist, semi-socialist government. Very incompetent, and the Norwegians understandably got tired of this. So unrelated to the oil and gas issue, they changed the government, as it happens in democracies, and they elected a conservative party, which was much more uh, pro-market and uh, uh, much stricter fiscal, uh, in terms of uh, running uh, government finances. Uh, so 
they introduced a much more business friendly regime, including uh, how they ran uh, oil and gas projects. And uh, yes, it's true, uh, Norway has a big government. The government taxes business very highly. The, the thing is that very often populists and friends of big government mention Norway as the main example of the benefits of having the, a big government. But I think the connection is there is an opposite causation. It's not that Norway became successful because it had a big government, but it is that it can afford to have a big government because it was so successful. Now, when you're so successful, you can decide, you know. And Norway, it seems, because it is a democracy, has decided it wants a big government. The next question is whether it would be better off having, being successful and having a small government. I would say it would be. But it's a bit of an optical aberration because Norway is already so successful, we cannot possibly imagine it can be even richer. But actually, it could. Um, the other thing about Norway, and I think this is the biggest problem when uh, the left mentions Scandinavian countries, and I know Scandinavian countries are very popular here as part of the political discourse. There's a problem. Uh, there, you know, there are some countries in the world which, uh, and whole regions, which are kind of a, uh, an odd exception. Uh, something, you know how they put it, like, this is, don't try to do it at home. Well, that's, you need to put this kind of tag on Scandinavia. Don't try to do it at home. The same thing you should put on the, uh, on, uh, the Gulf countries of the Middle East. Don't try to, to do it at home because, yeah, the Gulf countries of the Middle East in economic terms are a relative success. Yes. Scandinavian countries, for entirely different reasons, and Norway included, are a relative success. Uh, well, maybe even an absolute success. But, um, but that is related to their history and a certain tradition of running the government. Essentially, they can afford, to some degree, to have a big government for the following reasons. Uh, they're very honest in how they run their government. Uh, corruption is minimal there. I'm talking about Scandinavia, not the Middle East. Um, <laughs> corruption is minimal. Uh, also, they have a very strict approach, especially Norway and Sweden, and Denmark as well, uh, to economic freedom. Actually, if you look at the Fraser Institute, their ratings in terms of economic freedom as such are very high. When it comes to the category of the size of government, their ratings go down because they have big governments, and that's part of the rating. But when you single out how they treat businesses, they're very fair to businesses. Uh, they, you know, they have a, a very strict and independent judiciary. Uh, they respect contracts. They didn't do what um, Israel did with Tamar and Leviathan. They have high taxes, higher than in Israel, for hydrocarbons, but they're stable. Uh, so is it a model that you can replicate in another country? Most countries I know, I would say no. Um, especially when countries like Russia discuss it as a role model, I say, are you serious? You think that you can have that quality of civil service, given all the previous history? You can afford to have such a big government and an honest one? Be serious, it's not possible. So for most countries which are plagued with corruption, and institutional decay, I would say the solution is downsizing the government. It is not an affordable model. Back to your questions about a question about um, state ownership of Statoil and Petoro, the two government companies in, in Norway. Well, first of all, again, s most Norwegian companies are state owned. One of them, the biggest one, is Statoil. However, uh, 
again, that leads to the perception that all of Norway's oil and gas is state-owned. Well, that's not the case. Only about 60% of it is produced by Statoil and Petoro. The rest is produced by private companies in consortia with Statoil and Petoro. So uh, they have Shell, BP, uh, you know, um, and other companies, Total, operating uh, from all over the world in Norway. So they don't restrict access to foreign companies, but they work mostly in cooperation uh, with Statoil, sometimes without Statoil. So there's no prohibition against foreign companies or private companies as such. But yes, the, you know, inevitably from this model that Norway adopted, uh, they want to be in control of some portion of oil production. I would say it's not the most efficient model. They could have a more efficient model, but they have so much money already that they don't worry. You see, that's the other problem. When you have so much money, you kind of think, well, yeah, you know, we could do it better, but we like it that way anyway. Um, but that's not the case of Israel. I, need, I think Israel, do you agree with me? Israel needs more money. Um, and it's actually, uh, you know, it's not a rhetorical question about Norway because up until a certain point, uh, Norway was in a very paradoxical situation. Uh, apart from Statoil, uh, which is state-owned, uh, they also have the so-called Norwegian Pension Fund. It's misleading because it's actually not related to any pensions. It's a, what is called a stabilization fund. So what they do, and I'll talk about it a bit more later, uh, what they do, they um, put part of the revenues from oil and gas sales into a special fund that they then reinvest into the stock market uh, and keep it as a source of, as like, you know, f uh, a source of uh, money for a rainy day when oil prices are low, like today, relatively speaking, uh, or when something else happens, like an economic crisis, the financial crisis. So they have something like a fallback scenario. Um, because they have such a small population and because they have such high taxes, they, the fund grew to an enormous size for the country. The Norwegian pension fund now owns more than 1%, well, think about it, more, percent, one, more than one percent of the entire global stock market. And the question is, what do you do with it? They started all sorts of uh, charity programs, uh, global uh, development support programs for other countries, because the reality is they don't know what to do with the money. And I know all of us wished we had that problem. But uh, that's, it, it's a paradox, but it's true. My, I, had discuss, I regularly talk to Norwegians and Statoil and other companies. Uh, when I ask them that question, why do you need all this money in the, sovereign, in the uh, stabilization fund? Uh, they don't have a clear answer. Well, to, to to their defense, now it's kind of clear why they need it, because their revenues have dropped due to lower prices. So now they're saying, look, see, we have that cushion. We're clever, sure, but still the question is, do you need that much money in it? You know, uh, several times their GDP. I don't know. Um, I think that perhaps if you have something like this, you, it's, maybe you need to decrease taxes because the, clearly the government is taking so much money doesn't know what to do with it. Maybe the way is to recycle or, or to, to put like a, a barrier and to decrease what it's taking because it cannot spend it uh, despite all the, the big welfare programs. So there are questions um, which I, I was going to talk about it later, but since we are on it now, 
Um, which raises another interesting question. Um, are there alternatives way, alternative ways of redistributing oil rents? And that's, for Israel now, I think it seems like a rhetorical question, but the question because there's no, there are no significant rents coming in yet because these projects are very young, Tamar and Leviathan. So we're talking about the future. But sometimes it's okay to talk about the future. And uh, uh, what if Israel developed the other two trillion uh, cubic meter of gas? What if it found more, which is always an option, uh, and uh, got even more revenues from oil and gas, and eventually could become an oil and gas economy? Uh, that's that's one of the questions that I wanted to discuss with you, because you see, we're talking about it now, uh, about Iran, Venezuela, or the success stories like Norway or Australia or Canada, but maybe Israel will be one of them. I hope not like Iran or Venezuela, but one of those oil and gas economies. So. In a sense, you need to think now about how you want to structure that system of oil rent redistribution because it is very, very important in determin determining whether it's a success or a failure. So uh, one of the things that I've been uh, discussing uh, and writing about uh, is the issue of um, the oil dividend, uh, as it is sometimes called. Uh, it's been suggested by some economists. Uh, it's only been implemented in one country, and actually not even one country, in one province, in Alaska. Alaska pays, uh, I think, around $2,000 a year for, to every citizen as basically a share of the taxes that it gets from the oil companies. Um, and they started it back in the 80s. And in the beginning, it was like, you know, pocket money, like a hundred or a couple hundred dollars. But then it, it was growing and growing and growing as production was increasing. Uh, and now, even under low oil prices, uh, citizens were getting quite a lot of money. I mean, substantial amount of money. Not bad, you know, it's not a bad addition. Uh, but the main thing is, the government decided we are not best at managing these money. Also, it goes back to the question, what do you need to do? Do you need to really tax these companies because you presume that what is in the ground belongs to the people and you need to impose royalty? If that's what you agree on, then yes, okay, they pay royalty, but what do you do with the royalty then? And the Alaskans decided, we'll not spend it. We'll not even put it in a special fund like the Norwegians. They do actually, but only part of it. So they have a fund stabilization fund, and they have a, uh, a, a dividend, like a voucher that they pay to everyone. Um, and then, well, the question is, you know, it's funny how I, I spoke about it with so many politicians, and the reaction is usually the same. Well, people don't know what to do with their money. Uh, so you're saying you know better what they want to do with their money. It's a bad idea to give people money. Does it sound right? It doesn't sound right to me. Uh, it sounds like a populist measure, but if you believe in this paradigm that resources belong to everyone and everyone has an entitlement to it, but wouldn't it be fairer then to give it directly from the oil companies to the people? Well, okay, the government acts as an intermediary, just as a collector, and then it, it redistributes. So something to think about for the future, uh, about taxes and redistribution. Okay, I'm mindful about time. I think let's do one more question, and then I'll talk. And then if we have more time, we'll uh, go to questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would like to, to um, discuss your argument about mm. and um, I believe the metaphor. Let's say that, uh, okay, in Israel, now it's about this song, you know that? And uh, we have this costume which kids go inside the house and they search for something called matan, which is like a square. I know yeah. what is matan. You know it's yeah. 
So basically, they search for it. And what will happen if, you got, if the kid will find instead of the red, uh, whatever, flower one, will find the golden one? I guess they can just give it to him, but on, on the other hand, maybe people in the family would want to discuss it because they didn't expect it. And what I'm um, going forward is you use the slippery slope argument regarding the, the gas company. I'm saying that. I mean, not only that it's not fair legally, but it's also smart um, regarding the future. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying maybe it's the same thing for the other side. What happens if the government do not listen to the people? The people are mad, right? We, you also have said the people are mad, they want uh, their share. What happens if you know, people are mad and the government does not listen to them, saying that uh, your arguments? Then it, it can go also to a single stop, which uh, people lose trust in the government, people want to leave the country in a larger percent, people don't want to, to go and vote, uh, etc. Et well, it's interesting that your metaphor uh, compares uh, people to kids. And that's, I think, how government very often approaches the problem that uh, uh, people are little children. Are not uh, allowed to, or should should be, the government should keep an eye on them, and, and you know mm, they shouldn't be allowed too much independence in decision making. Now that's unfortunate uh, because I think people are, if they're not kids, uh, they're grown ups, and uh, in most cases they know better how to uh, use their money. I know what you mean about the golden matzah. Um, the problem with this analogy is, as I said, that the kids were not looking for a golden matzah. They just found it. That's not how it happened here with Tamar and Leviathan, or even Mary B., the first guest discovery. Uh, they were looking for it, and that's why they found it. They invested their money, and I mean they as in oil companies. They invested their money. They risked their money. They went to banks, they borrowed, uh, and they risked their business for that discovery. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a quote. I was reading about it, and I was just you know, fascinated. Um, you know who is uh, Professor Yaron Zelecha? OK. Uh, yeah, I was. Um, so at a rally against uh, a rally against oil and gas, okay. I don't know what it means, but uh, a rally against, as they call it, organized robbery. He said, uh, this is a monopoly that is selling our own gas back to us that it received for nothing. They say it's worth making concessions for the sake of Israel's uh, geostrategic standing, but Netanyahu has tuned uh, turned Israel into the country with the most expensive housing in the West. I don't see the connection. Um, okay, but you know, our gas got it for nothing. Um, this is sheer populism, and uh, let's let's separate populism from real issues. I think uh, it, this gas is not the golden matzah that you described. Uh, from an economic point of view, it's not. Uh, neither is it uh, something that uh, you know uh, you can uh, sell and make an amazing profit uh, because you have inv to invest so much. Uh, actually, the pro if you look at the stock market, the profitability, the average profitability uh, of a uh, oil company uh, is not average, not higher than telecoms or uh, agribusiness. There is a reason for that. It's as other businesses, it's not also a business. And it has its ups and downs. It has a particular s way of managing risks. They're uh, distributed very unevenly because you have uh, geological risks that you won't find something in the ground or underneath the water. There are uh, political and other risks security risks, and uh, then there are price risks. 
because there's a great volatility of prices. So now Israel is actually, uh, the decisions, Israel is in that exact position, which is not perfect for Israel because most of the decisions about oil and gas investments and taxations, taxation were made during high oil and gas prices. Remember, the, the Shashinsky Commission was in 2011, if, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken. That was a time of highest prices. Oil was $110 a barrel. So um, now, when oil is only less than half of that, the economics of these projects is entirely different. So perhaps it's not a golden matzah, not even a silver matzah anymore. It's more like a copper matzah, you know? Uh, and they have to pay the same tax rates that they agreed with the Shashinsky Commission, you see? And when people say, oh, but they're not, remember what uh, Beanie said, uh, what, uh, they're not paying 60% gross tax rate uh, now. They're only paying 10%. Well, but they haven't sold anything from Leviathan yet. You know, why would they pay? Or even Tamar, yes, they're selling, but there is a, and I, there is a concept of cost recovery. They have to recover the costs. So they are not making a purely, uh, you know, strictly speaking, they're not making a profit. So there is a royalty, and then there is a way to recover your costs, which in an oil uh, project like this or a gas project like this takes years and until you start making the profit, then you're paying the full maximum rate. So yes, taxes are, you're not paying that 60% from day one. And imagine another business being approached from the same, in the same way, a bakery or a, a cell phone company uh, or a mobile operator pay us taxes before you made any profit. No, of course not. But with oil, because you're producing oil, people think that once you're producing oil, that's it, you're rich. But that's not true. And same for gas. That's not the case. Um, so I'm, uh, I'll be, I, I'll tell you what, I'll be very happy if Noble Energy and Dalek make a profit comparable to Noble Energy's other assets in the US and other countries in Israel. And I, I mean it, I'll be very happy. You know why? Because if they make a comparable profit, that will send a very strong sing signal to other companies which will be willing to come and invest, which is currently, unfortunately, not the case, as far as I know. Right, uh, slides. What was I going to talk about? Um, the balancing act of uh, oil and gas, uh, managing oil and gas rents, private and state oil companies. Some of this we have already covered, so I'll, I'll go a bit faster than yesterday. Uh, low oil prices and low gas prices. Can you uh, be successful during low and, uh, oil and gas prices? Yes, you can, but it's harder. Uh, well, gas and innovators. Uh, the shale industry, as, a sil as I call it, the Silicon Valley of the energy sector. And then offshore oil and gas development, some lessons from other countries. So uh, it's a bit like this, balancing uh, the management of oil and gas rents, to go back to your question. It's a very s difficult balancing act, uh, not to deter further investment and development. Um, we did a study on uh, comparing oil and gas companies, private and state. So let's, again, to, to, be, uh, um, to, uh, to make it all relevant to Israel, let's go one by one uh, through some problems that Israel is facing. So remember that first dilemma, because there was that dilemma to nationalize or to privatize, to keep it private or to uh, give it to the government. Israel has made a decision, which I think was the right one, to make it private. Uh, but some, many countries have made a different decision. So it's important to compare uh, the performance of state and private companies in the oil sector. So we took the biggest ones for which information is available, because for many state companies, and that's another problem, information is not available. 
So we took those which actually release information. And we compared their income per barrel. Uh, and we took an average of income per barrel. And it turns out that during high oil prices in 2013, uh, private, like Chevron, Exxon, BP, Shell, Total, ConocoPhillips, were on average 56% more profitable than state-owned companies. And uh, by the way, some of the state-owned companies are not the, m the least efficient. Like state oil is actually, by, for a state company, is very efficient, perhaps the most efficient company uh, among state oil companies. Uh, interestingly, next year, when oil prices dropped, uh, we made the same analysis. And interestingly, the difference was even bigger. So that shows that private companies are better placed to manage price volatility. Okay? Uh, an important uh, result. Uh, why is it the case? Well, there are obvious reasons that uh, a private ownership is more efficient than government ownership. The interesting thing is that this is achieved in, uh, in unequal circumstances. Usually state companies in their state-owned territory have an advantage over private, especially foreign companies. So you could say, actually, if you apply a certain discount rate to the right side, you could say, actually, they are probably, if you compare apples to apples and remove the advantages that they have, and they do have in many countries advantages, not in Norway. In Norway, it's all pretty fair. But in, in countries like Venezuela or Russia, I mean, state companies, they rule it, their industries. They have an absolute advantage in accessing licenses and so on, uh, in regulation. But still, they, they don't perform as well as private. Mm. I have a question. Um, it seems to me that there's a potential problem with this because net uh, income is an accounting number, it's not a cash flow number. Sorry? Net income is an accounting number. It's, 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 not a, it's, it's not a cash flow number. And so it leads me to more about two, two things. Number one, it seems to me that, that because you're, you're really looking at an accounting number that's not necessarily related to, to the cash that the company is getting per barrel. And that you really should be looking at, at net cash flow per barrel as opposed to net income. So that's, that's number one. And number two, because it's the accounting number, you know, and you have all the stuff that, that goes into that, you know, and taxes and, and whatever. Uh, and ultimately, the point of, the, of, of that calculation is, is, is taxation. Uh, if there's a comparison between state companies and, and private companies. Yeah. Well, this is a cash flow number in a sense. It's not a flow. It's one uh, cash receipt in one year. So cash flow consists of those for several years. But uh, this is net income. So it is what the company well, what gets. Net, net in income is, is not a cash number. It's, it's, it's a tax calculation. It's an accounting number. But it's post-tax. It's a post-tax number, Bob. So it, we deliberately took not EBITDA, which is pre-tax, but post-tax, because we wanted to look at pure profit. Uh, because, yes, tax regimes are different. But we wanted to see how, regardless to the tax regime, how the company performs. You know, yes, some of these companies, but the thing is, these companies here, they operate in ma many different countries. So they have to face different tax rates in different jurisdictions. These companies usually operate in mostly one country, and their tax, taxes differ. So yes, there is a tax issue involved, because some of them pay higher taxes. But it's not clear that those pay higher tax the, taxes than those. It, it would require a whole different analysis. 
We have a similar graph for EBITDA before taxes, and it's a similar picture. It's pretty similar. The blue is still higher than the red. So whether you take net income per barrel or EBITDA before tax, it's a similar picture. Okay? Yeah. I would guess that government-owned companies mostly sell to the government or the same country. Or at least it would be a big share of their sellings. And is it possible that, for example, PetroChina is obliged to sell at a certain price, which is less than market price, and that is what causes it to be less profitable for any other uh, it may be in some cases. Uh, yes, domestic prices are often regulated, but um, it is uh, a problem for some companies. I'm looking at the list, uh, but keep in mind two things. Uh, first of all, uh, yes, there are some regulated markets. Uh, the, the way energy can be subsidized can come in many forms. In most cases, these companies sell at a market price, and then something is being adjusted. Gazprom doesn't sell at a market; sells at a special price. Yes, Gazprom suffers from that. But then, private companies operate in, in jurisdictions where they have to do the same. They don't have an exception from this. So, if a company operates in a country like uh, Nigeria and sells something to the uh, sells something to the domestic market they will have to, to go through the same process. So it's, it's possible, but it's not like, again, that these suffer necessarily more than these. Not necessarily. Because let's, uh, these private companies, they don't operate at some other planet. They work in the same countries, primarily. But uh, they just uh, work in a different way. Yeah. It's not an ideal comparison, but it, it, it's a, it's a, it gives you an, a general idea about performance. And you know, there are some extreme cases. Uh, this company is not here for a reason. For instance, Mexico's Pemex. They started releasing uh, uh, financial information quite late because the state company, that's the other thing. The, a government company doesn't have to. A private company listed on the stock market does have to. Uh, or even a state company like Rosneft, which is listed on the stock market, has to release. So that's kind of a step forward. But a company like, uh, for instance, uh, like Saudi Aramco, or all of the Gulf companies, they don't release any information. So we don't even know. Uh, but Pedavesa, uh, sorry, um, Pemex, which is not here, started. And the interesting thing is, throughout the whole period of time uh, of high oil prices from 2003 to 2013, they were at the brink of making a loss. It's unbelievable. You know, they were open about it. Yeah, we're working at a loss. There were years when they actually made a loss, when, the, when oil was 100 and above per barrel. So that's sort of the extreme case of inefficiency. Um, low oil and gas prices. Uh, is it pot well, some people ask, well, prices can be so low, and then you're, uh, then, then you're facing a major problem. Well, it is a problem, but in a sense, uh, People talk about the volatility curse, the volatility of oil and gas prices. But my response to this is, well, first of all, prices are volatile in other industries as well. It's not just in oil and gas. Uh, and companies have to deal with price volatility in other businesses. For instance, uh, some medicines or uh, some high-tech devices, their prices can be quite volatile. Uh, you know, and um, uh, there uh, some in, in high tech industries, uh, for instance, uh, uh, devices can go out of fashion. The case of Nokia, you know, which was one of the, the biggest uh, phone provider, 
Uh, then it went out of fashion. Now it's tra trying to reinvent itself as a sort of alternative to a smartphone. But there is a lot of volatility they have to deal with. But I never heard about a uh, mobile phone volatility curse. They just manage somehow. With oil, it's always a curse. Wow, we're low prices, we're cursed. Well, if you look at, there's, um, there are lessons to be learned because in the 80s, from 81 to 86, the, the world went through a drop in oil prices which was actually deeper than the one we experienced just now. It was a drop of about 72%. And what happened, as you would expect, uh, is that in that period of time, 81 to 86, most oil exporting countries uh, went through a crisis. Their GDP per capita dropped. They had negative rates. Some really very deep, uh, de uh, deep contractions like, uh, the, uh, like Saudi Arabia or the Emirates. And part of the reasons for Saudi Arabia was because they were cutting production as well, which was really not a wise thing to do, but, uh, as they found out. But uh, there were actually five countries, as we discovered, which grew positively during that period of time. And those were uh, very different countries. Oman, Indonesia, Norway, Malaysia, and Canada. Algeria had sort of a low, below 1%, so uh, not that fast. Uh, but all of these countries had above 1% growth rates. Did they have anything in common that we can sort of uh, summarize and learn from? They did. Uh, we looked at their policies, and what they had in common was that they either had a stabilization fund or they were about to introduce a stabilization fund. So they were saving. They were saving for a rainy day. Um, and the other thing is that after this period of time, uh, the world entered what is known as the period of the big oil glut, excessive oil production, and prices stayed relatively low for almost 20 years. So not as low as in this period, this is what the biggest drop, but then they kind of more, almost stabilized and stayed quite low. Uh, in the period of the next 20 years, or rather the overall period, sorry, of 20 years, up until 2000, uh, the leaders of growth were the same five countries. So they obviously did something right. And as I said, they had introduce stabilization funds or sovereign funds, one or another way of saving money. Uh, secondly, and counterintuitively, what they did was they increased oil production, while Saudi Arabia and other OPEC countries decreased oil production, trying to support the oil price unsuccessfully. Um, those countries used that as an opportunity to gain market share. With the exception of Indonesia, because Indonesia was back then part of OPEC. So it had to comply with, uh, with quotas. But they did something clever. They had to follow the quota system. But they alternatively increased gas production. So they compensated the loss of revenue from oil by increasing gas production. And Norway and Malaysia did exactly the same. They increased gas production. You can see it here. And actually, Norway uh, basically, basically went from scratch. Uh, and you see that Oman increased almost double, tripled uh, gas production in Indonesia as well. Uh, and you can see that uh, Malaysia, for instance, almost doubled oil production in that period of time. So that's the, the other thing. The third thing that they did was to... Uh, Institu introduce some institutional change. Remember what I mentioned about Norway, how they reformed their economy and introduced a more business-friendly, stable regime. Uh, Canada had a, a state-run oil company, Petro-Canada. Uh, at some point, they privatized it, and that helped them. 
So now Canada has no government controlled oil companies. It's all entirely privately owned and, compet uh, uh, and competitive. Uh, Indonesia is a mixed case. Uh, now it has fallen really f sharply in the ratings. But back then, in the 80s, Indonesia was a, a rising star of the development world. Uh, it, it was introducing a lot of, I mean, politically it was very controversial, and I'm not going to go into that. But in terms of economic institutions, it rose in ratings like Fraser really sharply. Malaysia went from a really poor country to being number 15 and then number 13 in the Fraser Institute rating. So they increased their institutional quality really sharply. Uh, and Oman is considered to be probably the most pro-business country in the Gulf. So there was that element, which I think is key, that they worked on their economic institutions to be more attractive for business and investors. And that uh, allowed them to both increase oil and gas production, but also to diversify. Because you hear often this mantra of diversification. Oh, we cannot depend on just oil and gas. We need to diversify. Uh, well, the problem is that usually governments talk about it when it's too late already. Uh, and the key to the diversification, in my view, is having the right institutional system, enough economic freedom, uh, and a business-friendly environment to allow uh, entrepreneurs to innovate in other sectors. Uh, speaking of innovation, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting that when um, you, you, you heard, apart from the shale revolution, there was the uh, revolution of liquefied natural gas, and uh, Israel might benefit from it at some point, because uh, it would be a uh, much more flexible way for Israel to export its gas, not relying on a pipeline. Uh, so. Uh, the world went through a liquefied natural gas revolution, which allowed to detach gas sales from one destination, like from Russia to Germany, or from Russia to other countries of Europe, or from Central Asia to China, and to sell gas to many different countries to choose the buyer. Uh, and that decreased gas prices, that uh, uh, allowed more competition, uh, and detached partially the gas price from the oil price. Uh, Several countries capitalized on this uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas revolution, specifically Malaysia, Australia, and Qatar. Other countries, remember that ostrich approach, were in denial. One of them was Russia. The CEO of Gazprom, Alexei Miller, said that uh, the LNG, liquefied natural gas revolution, will not happen. It's impossible. The world will rely on pipelines. The, what happened over the next several years, there was a massive increase in LNG transportation. Um, the same thing happened with uh, the shale revolution. Uh, for instance, Russian and some other petrostate politicians said, it doesn't matter, you know, shale production in the US, well, it will add a few thousand barrels per day in production, but it's not going to make a major difference. And guess what? It actually was what made the main difference. So this ostrich approach reminds me often of uh, this cartoon. The attitude to innovation is a bit like this. Like this uh, grumpy old fish uh, telling the little uh, tiny fish which is creeping out of the ocean uh, and ready to become uh, uh, a new uh, type of animal uh, living on the, on the surface of the earth, well, this innovation will fail. Well, often governments uh, act as this big old fish, uh, grumpy about innovation. Uh, but innovation produces results. And uh, I think that Israel, in general, is a very good example of this. And I only hope that it will not be limited to high-tech industries, that it can also go into innovating in oil and gas. And what I mean by this is the following. 
for instance, uh, it's not only about the amount of reserves in the ground, because people will say, well, okay, one, two, three trillion uh, cubic meters of gas is not awfully much. Actually, it is a lot, if it's true, because I'll tell you in terms of where Israel stands, uh, if it's true, and it is an if, that Israel has, for instance, two trillion cubic uh, meters of gas, it will put it in the same category as countries in terms of gas reserves, like uh, Norway, Malaysia, Azerbaijan, United Arab Emir Emirates, and Kazakhstan. Not the least significant oil and gas producers. Uh, I mean, they're not the top. Uh, Russia, Iran, and other countries, and Saudi Arabia have, have much more. But uh, those are important strategic uh, uh, provinces, uh, hydrocarbon provinces. And, um, but it's not just about the amount, because uh, it's about the ability to discover and develop. You can be sitting like Iran or Venezuela on enormous amounts of oil and gas and have them underdeveloped because you don't have the institutions supporting innovation and investment. Uh, so, for instance, the case, again, of the shale revolution tells us that uh, it's not about the amount of reserves. The U.S. is by far the leader of shale gas production. Uh, as it is right now, it's basically producing all the shale gas in the world. There's ti there are tiny amounts produced by other countries. They're expected to grow, but the U.S., according to the BP Energy Outlook, will be the biggest shale gas producer for years and years to come. Is it the biggest in reserves? No, it's not. Countries like Algeria, Argentina, and China notably are sitting on much bigger shale gas reserves, not being developed. So it's not the amount in the ground which matters most. It's the institutional framework. Uh, the Arctic, which you asked about, uh, is another example. Remember I told you that countries uh, uh, had to put those projects on hold? Uh, some actually used the opportunity of high oil and gas prices to invest during high prices. And they're now in the stage of production. So for instance, again, uh, oil resources versus production. Uh, Russia has by far the biggest oil resources in the Arctic, but very small production compared to the U.S. and Norway. And with gas, Russia has by far the biggest gas resources in the Arctic, but zero production. Norway has it all. You see, so... Uh, it's, there's no direct correlation. It's the institutional framework. Um, maybe, well, it's time to stop. I'll, I can take one or two questions. Uh, yeah. Who has the jurisdiction in the North Pole? Hmm? The jurisdiction in the North Pole. Uh, who, who controls it? Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a special UN convention on that, uh, which basically divides the Arctic into certain zones. It works differently from uh, other, I think it works different from other uh, oceanic zones. So the extension is greater there. So there are several uh, layers, several types of control of the sea, and the biggest extension from, uh, from the land is in the Arctic. But there are still disputes, or, such as, for instance, between Russia and Norway uh, about who controls what, because it's not always clear how do you extend from a particular island or peninsula, uh, and they can overlap. Uh, but I don't think that the, it's called delineation or, uh, uh, of, of these uh, disputed zones. I don't think this is the biggest problem. Right now, the biggest problem is uh, uh, low prices, which don't allow to develop. Yeah, but it's interesting after the, the prices, if the prices will go up, then how would 
uh, countries decide uh, which uh, reserve mm -hmm. belongs to which country? Actually, uh, there were some disputes uh, and some emotion, emotions running high, but uh, by and large, the Arctic Council, which is the council of countries which uh, have access to the Arctic waters, uh, they're pretty good in, in negotiating. They, have m able, they were able to resolve most problems with, uh, with disputed areas. So I think that uh, they understand that they have an they have an interest to develop in, develop it in peace. I think that will prevail. I'm not so worried about that. Uh, you talked previously about the the interest and comfort there the private companies against the mm -hmm. public companies. Yeah. So the question is divided into two. First one, the, what uh, what is the total net income? of these companies, like number of barrels multiplied by the, the net income per barrel. And the second one is, what proportion of this money goes to the benefit of the public? If private companies' profit goes to the, sh to the shareholders. Yeah. What about the uh, public companies? Like where, 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 where does their profit go to? Excellent question. Uh, excellent, excellent question. Well, the number, if you care, is here. So you have, in, in, during high oil prices, it was $17.3 per barrel and $11.12 per barrel. Um, so again, that goes back to the interesting question. You know, it was $100 per barrel oil, the price of oil. That's how much they were getting in income. Oh, the total, I, I, I don't have it from the top of my head. I don't know. You, you can, each of these companies, the reason these companies are here is because they have publicly available uh, financial uh, reports, so you can check it. Uh, you mean the gross overall number? Yeah. For all of them or for each of them? Well, I don't remember that. Uh, but it's easily available. Uh, you, can, you can check that information. Uh, where it's a very good question about um, where does money go uh, in terms of dividends, and that's not always a very uh, transparent issue, because it's that's true. For private companies, uh, what they make in profit is divided between reinvestment into their business and paying to shareholders, and shareholders decide how they want through the board how they want to split that income between reinvestment and growth, or maybe acquisitions, uh, and cash. Uh, and that depends on their priorities, you know, that's a collective decision. With the governments, again, it's a tricky one. So it depends on the lobbying power. I'll give you the example of the, of the Russian uh, companies like Rosneft, for example. They're constantly bickering with the government about dividends because this, these dividends go to the government. And uh, they, they're not interested in maximizing the interest of the shareholders, so to speak, because they're managers. So there's a con conflict between management and the government. They try to underestimate what they make in profit to then spend it on different things, not necessarily things that they need, because they're not so interested in satisfying the interests of the shareholder. And also, they have a lobbying capacity because they're very influential, people like Igor Sechin and Rosneft, the CEO, to make government take decisions in their interests rather than the interests of the general population. So there's a very non-transparent and often um, sort of um, murky relationship there. You know, it's not so straightforward. Would the government benefit from them reinvesting more or giving more money back to the government? Who makes that decision? You know, in a, in a private company, it's pretty clear. In a government situation, it's not very clear. Do we have any more time or not? Yeah? Okay. That's, that's fairness. Thank you. Okay, please. It's a short question. Um, well, regardless of what is just, I don't think uh, Noble Energy or other companies are really naive. 
and they have to take into account the reputation or corruption in at least a new com a new country they come into. Yeah. So I'm I'm not shifting responsibility, but well, I would say re um, reputation is another currency, and they should know that this might be a good time for Israel to waste that reputation because oil is a big business for Israel for a long time. So did they not foresee it? The, the change of the rules? Mm. Why, why are you saying it's a good time to waste its reputation? I think it's an awful time to waste its reputation. Well, it's the beginning it when be. you really don't want to mess it up. You're right. I, I can't say it's a good time, but I mean, Israel might think it's a good time. Ah, That's what okay. I'm trying to say. Okay, so you're saying they should have anticipated the wave of populism related to this investment. Maybe they, they took a leap of faith. Uh, and I don't want to overestimate what they did. They acted like, you're right, they acted like a normal business company. They weighed risks and returns. They, they made an assessment. I think in retrospect, they probably were overly optimistic given what happened. Uh, I think for Israel, it is important to keep a reputation. But you see, noble energy, that's the thing. They, they're stuck with their investment here now. They're probably not considering extension because they're already in enough trouble and delays, uh, which is bad. It would be nice if they explored further and invested more. Now Israel will have to look for other companies. and It's, it's not easy in the current environment of low prices. Uh, they can now invest in other jurisdictions and they'll probably choose them over Israel, possibly. Uh, but, you know, Israel will have to look for other investors. So it, the burden is now on Israel. Uh, the other thing that I, um, you see, it's hard for me to understand. I mean, yes, populism is uh, a common problem in many countries. but. There must be some common sense because uh, first it was a dispute about the taxation. Uh, okay, it was considered too low. Retroactively, it was changed. The Shashinsky uh, Commission introduced new taxation. It was agreed. Still, a lot of politicians, as far as I understand, to the best of my understanding of this, were not happy because they said, "Oh no, no, no! It's it, they're stealing money. They're not paying the 60% now. They should be paying it now." Well, it's not how it works in business. They need to, you see, they, they, there's a need for uh, education here. There's common sense and education. So if somebody explained these people, this professor, that uh, that's not how business works, but supposedly he was an accountant in the Ministry of Finance, he must understand that. But somehow he pretends he doesn't. Um, then there was the other thing. Oh, okay, we agreed taxes, but oh, no, no, you, you cannot s export gas or you shouldn't export too much because we need to supply the Israeli market. So, oh, and by the way, you cannot charge what you want on the, in the Israeli market. We have to fix the price. So that's another hurdle because, okay, you change taxes and now you're changing also the price system and the ability to export. So how are they going to make initially intended returns? It's not clear whether they're going to make returns. And then they're say, you're saying, okay, they agreed a partially fixed price domestically with a certain share going to the domestic market. That's, as far as I understand, agreed again. And then they're saying, oh, hold on, we forgot. So now we agreed that, but they're a monopoly. Okay, didn't you know that before? But it's unacceptable. So now we have another commission considering demonopolization. Not only do they have to pay higher taxes, sell a share at a fixed price to the domestic market, restrict their exports. They also have to work, uh, they also have to then sell a share of their business to another company, which by the way might not be easy to do given all of what happened. And then finally, they're, they're told, okay, you have to sell a share. Oh, and by the way, there's a security risk. There's only one pile, pipeline planned. So what if Hamas attacks that pipeline? And then the, 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 there's a massive blackout in Israel. 
So we need at least two pipelines. Actually, no, 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 hold. We need three pipelines. Uh, actually, better four. And you pay for it. You know, I, I understand the security risks are real, but there's, there needs to be some common sense about business. You see, Norway, um, th they have a big government, but at an early stage they realized that you cannot squeeze the last penny out of the oil business. You have to allow some room, and then you will benefit. And they benefited massively by allowing that room. But it took them years to understand it. Uh, I think that Israel in this, is in this learning process where the oil and gas business is new, and Israel has to still really um, learn how it works, the population, because there's less of that populism, for instance, in Norway, because they already know how it works, and they know, they know it benefits them. I think Israel will have to go through this process, hopefully with a success. I very much hope for that. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. Very quick. Uh, my understanding uh, from this lecture that uh, uh, the best means to handle the money that uh, comes from the uh, oil industry or the gas industry is the stabilization fund. My question is if it's the best mean to handle the money and if it's generally and specifically uh, with Israel. Does it really have one? Yeah. They yeah. decided really? to have one. It was uh, supposed to be for education or healthcare, mm -hmm. but it ended up being education, healthcare, and security. Okay. And now, <laughs> percentages. Uh, yeah. Okay. But, but is money, uh, will money be coming from gas into yeah, that fund? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Well, as I said, the quick... This is the best Yeah. I, I think it's a useful idea in general. I don't think that you need it as a limitless organization. I think you need to have limits, not to run into Norway's problem. But you're far away from that. So I don't think you need to worry about becoming Norway very quickly uh, and face those problems. So... Um, but I think, yeah, it is generally a useful idea. It, the two things I, I think are important. Uh, first of all, it should be as removed from politics and populism as possible. So preferably run by, by an independent body, uh, removed from the government and especially from the Knesset, because otherwise it will be spent in one day. Uh, and secondly, uh, an, a good idea is to invest outside of Israel. I know, again, it's, it, populists hate that idea. But that's the idea, actually, like Norway is doing it. To, uh, you, you deliberately pick very low-risk investments, and you spread it out. So it's actually not dependent on the risk profile of your own country. It's quite important. But uh, uh, I hope that uh, the time when you will be solving the problems of the problems like Norway solving will come sooner than later. And Israel will be rich from many things, including oil and gas. Thank you very much.